Hi, and welcome to the virtual and in-person AWP Conference and Book Fair. I am Michelle Aielli, a member of the AWP Board of Directors. For accessibility, I'd like to offer a physical description of myself. I am a white woman with dark hair that's braided to the side, and I'm wearing a blue sweater. We are delighted to bring you this event today, a reading and conversation with Rivka Galchin and Ruth Ozeki, moderated by Zachary Steele, sponsored by the Authors Guild. Our literary partners and sponsors allow AWP to present these extraordinary literary events and help us keep our conference affordable and accessible. A thank you to all of our conference sponsors and partners for their support and participation. This conference was pre-recorded and is premiering on Saturday, March 26th from 3.20 to 4.35 p.m. Eastern time. After the conclusion of this event, it will be available for on-demand viewing. During the event's premiere, please enter your questions or comments into the platform chat box on the right of the screen. If you are watching on demand, feel free to continue to leave comments in the chat box to the right of the video. We thank you so much for attending and for your continued support of AWP. We hope you enjoy this event. Hello and welcome all. My name is Zachary Steele. I am the founder and executive director of Broadleaf Writers Association, Broadleaf Writers Association in Atlanta, Georgia, and the author of The Weight of Ashes. I am pleased today to moderate a conversation with um, authors Rivka Galchin and Ruth Ozeki. And this conversation is sponsored by the Authors Guild. The Authors Guild is the oldest and largest professional organization for writers in the U.S. They offer a supportive community and a variety of services on the business aspects of being an author, including legal reviews of publishing contracts and free educational programming. You can learn more and find a trove of recorded webinars at authorsguild.org. If you'd like to join the Authors Guild, you can use the code AWP2022, which will give you a 20% discount, and that would be capital AWP2022. Uh, definitely check them out. They're a great, great organization. So as I said, today I am both thrilled and honored to be able to sit with these two amazing authors. And um, before we jump into readings and conversation, I'll give just a very brief bio on them both. Uh, Rivka Gauchin is a staff writer at The New Yorker, and she has contributed fiction and nonfiction to the magazine since 2008. She is the author of two novels, Atmospheric Disturbance, and Everyone Knows Your Mother is a Witch, a short story collection, and an essay collection, and a novel for children. Ruth Ozeki is a novelist, filmmaker, and Zen Buddhist priest whose books have garnered international acclaim for their ability to integrate issues of science, technology, religion, environmental politics, and global pop culture into unique hybrid narrative forms. She is the author of one work of nonfiction, The Face, A Time Code, and three novels, My Year of Meats, All Over Creation, The Book Form, and, and The Book of Form and Emptiness. Um, and actually, I think I'd I neglected one in there, didn't I? It was, yes, a tale for the time being. My apologies on that one. But that that little oversight aside, thank you and welcome both. Um, I'm thrilled to have you here and looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. And um, so before we get into our lengthy conversation and fire questions back and forth, um, we're going to go ahead and give you guys a few minutes to read. Um, in ode to alphabetical um, preference, we're going to go with Rivka because when we go first name or last name, you still lose and have to go first. You get the short <laughs> straw. Uh, so what we're going to do is give you the stage, let you read for a little bit, um, and then uh, we will transition over to Ruth for your reading. All right. Uh, thanks, Zach. I'm really excited to be here with you. I'm really excited to be here with Ruth. And I'm going to read from my novel, Everyone Knows Your Mother is a Witch, which is, I call it the Cadbury novel because it's, that's the only other time I've seen this color of purple. Anyway, so here we go. I'm gonna actually read from the opening because that way I don't have to give a synopsis of anything. So here, here we start. Herein I begin my account with the help of my neighbor, Simon Sadler, since I am unable to read or write. I maintain that I am not a witch, never have been a witch, I'm a relative to no witches. But from very early in life, I had enemies. When I was a child, 
Our cow mare at my father's inn was cross and bitter toward me. I didn't know why. I wouldn't hesitate to put a blue silk ribbon on her neck if she were here today. She died from the milk fever, which was no doing of mine. Though as a young child, I felt it was my doing because Mare had kicked me and I had then called her fat kidneyed. Was she my enemy? It takes time and experience to gain a cow's trust. Now I'm 70 some years old. I'll spend no more time on the enemies or loves of my youth and middle age. I'll say only that I've never before had even the smallest run in with the law, not for fighting, not for cursing, not for licentiousness, not for the pettiest theft. Yet attributed to me in this trial is the power to poison, to make lame, to pass through locked doors, to be the death of sheep, goats, cows, infants, and grapevines, and even to cure at will. As you know, I can't even win it back, Gammon. If my defense fails, a confession will be sought through torture, first with thumb screws, then with leg braces, then with the rack or something like that. It depends who the council hires for the job. If mercy is taken upon me, I'll be beheaded and then burned. If no mercy is taken, I'll be burned without first being beheaded. That happened to seven women last year in Regensburg. My children, with some help, have been coordinating my defense. There are two things a woman must do alone. She does her own believing and her own dying. So says Martin Luther, or so you say that Martin Luther says or said. I was born the year Luther died. I took Catholic communion only one time in error. My daughter Greta is married to a pastor who says that's okay. My son Hans agrees. I hold Luther in the highest esteem. He too was vilified. Again, I'm grateful to you, Simon, for sitting with me, for writing for me, for being my legal guardian. This is my truest testimony. Thanks. That was wonderful, Rivka. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask a question before we move on to, to Ruth and her reading that um, I, I couldn't help but notice when reading this one that uh, despite the serious nature of the story itself, the, the tone within the book is, is highly conversational and it's just laced with humor. And I'm curious if that was something that you uh, did intentionally or if it was something that evolved through the writing. Yeah. And um you know, it's almost uh, the opening is almost the sort of most somber part. It's kind of her clearing her throat and sort of imagining that she's sort of like turning on the personality that's appropriate there. And then it kind of falls back into her more natural voice. Um, and, and, you know, it's so funny when you, when you make anything, when you make um, uh, a book or a drawing or, or like a note, <laughs> um, there's the, there's the part that comes very obviously. And I just, it was very obvious to me that her, that she was um, irreverent and, and, and resilient and funny and, and lively and kind of difficult. That was just sort of like the, the sort of cast of women that she was kind of put together in my mind were those kind of people, the sort of people who, um, you know, like, like you, like you see sort of, um, in the news today, people under um, tremendous duress are often kind of funnier and wittier and, and use that as a, as a survival tactic more than, um, than the rest of us in our sort of more simple lives. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, obviously, I have many questions for you, um, but we're going to switch over to Ruth real quick and let her do her reading, and then we will get back to both of you. All right. Thank you, Zach. Rivka, that was so wonderful. Uh, and the voice too, I, I, in reading the book, I was just captivated, you know, right from the start. It was, it was really wonderful. Um, so this is, my book is also a book about voices. And um, uh, so I think I'll also read from the beginning and uh, this way maybe um, give you a little sense of the the narrator, um, the the uh, the narrator's voice. The book is actually being narrated by the book. So the book of form and emptiness is being narrated by the book of form and emptiness, um, and so that's the first voice you'll hear. And um, it, the whole thing is structured as a conversation between um, the book, 
uh, who is telling the story of Benny O, who's the little boy um, who in the book uh, starts to hear voices. So, in the beginning, a book must start somewhere. One brave letter must volunteer to go first, laying itself on the line in an act of faith from which a word takes heart and follows, drawing a sentence into its wake. From there, a paragraph amasses, and soon a page, and the book is on its way, finding a voice, calling itself into being. A book must start somewhere, and this one starts here. A boy. Shh, listen. That's my book, and it's talking to you. Can you hear it? It's okay if you can't, though. It's not your fault. Things speak all the time, but if your ears aren't attuned, you have to learn to listen. You can start by using your eyes because eyes are easy. Look at all the things around you. What do you see? A book, obviously. And obviously the book is speaking to you. So try something more challenging. The chair you're sitting on, the pencil in your pocket, the sneaker in your foot. Still can't hear? Well, then get down on your knees and put your head to the seat or take off your shoe and hold it to your ear. No, wait, if there are people around, they'll think you're mad, so try it with the pencil first. Pencils have stories inside them, and they're safe as long as you don't stick the point in your ear. Just hold it next to your head and listen. Can you hear the wood whisper, the ghost of the pine, the mutter of lead? Sometimes it's more than one voice. Sometimes it's a whole chorus of voices rising from a single thing especially if it's a made thing with lots of different makers, but don't be scared. I think it depends on the kind of day they were having back in Guangdong or Laos or wherever. And if it was a good day at the old sweatshop, if they were enjoying a pleasant thought at the moment when that particular grommet came tumbling down the line and passed through their fingers, then that pleasant thought will cling to the whole. Sometimes it's not so much a thought as a feeling, a nice warm feeling like love, for example sunny and yellow. But when it's a sad feeling or an angry one that gets laced into your shoe, then you better watch out because that shoe might do crazy shit, like marching your feet right up to the front of the Nike store, for example, where you could wind up smashing the display window with a baseball bat made of furious wood. If that happens, it's still not your fault. Just apologize to the window, say I'm sorry to the glass, and whatever you do, don't try to explain. The arresting officer doesn't care about the crappy conditions in the bat factory. He won't care about the chainsaws or the sturdy ash tree that the bat used to be. So just keep your mouth shut. Stay calm, be polite, and remember to breathe. It's really important not to get upset because then the voices will get the upper hand and take over your mind. Things are needy. They take up space. They want attention and they'll drive you mad if you let them. So just remember, you're like the air traffic controller. No, wait, you're like the leader of a big brass band made up of all the jazzy stuff of the planet. And you're floating out there in space, standing on this great garbage heap of a world with your hair slicked back and your natty suit and your stick up in the air, surrounded by all the eager things. And for one quick, beautiful moment, all their voices go silent, waiting till you bring your baton down. Music or madness, it's totally up to you. The book. So start with the voices then. When did he first hear them? When he was still little? Benny was always a small boy and slow to develop, as though his cells were reluctant to multiply and take up space in the world. It seems he pretty much stopped growing when he turned 12, the same year his father died and his mother started putting on weight. The change was subtle, but Benny seemed to shrink as Annabelle grew, as if she were metabolizing her small son's grief along with her own. Yes, that seems right. Okay. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you. I, I, I absolutely love 
the contrast of having a book tell me a story. So, um, you know, I, <laughs> well, I'm it's all, a talking thing, right? So yes, <laughs> I, I absolutely everybody. love that. Um, and I do want to stick. It'd probably be a common theme with our conversation with you because mm -hmm. because you write about voices throughout your entire story. But um, there there is speaking of contrast, one between the the narrative voice of the book and Benny himself, and. Um, I, I, I've never in my life put these two words together. So apologies, because I'm probably going to have to explain myself. But um, I, I read him in a sort of manic savant kind of way, ah. like like a sort of fringe of, of madness, but with like keen observations and 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 high intelligence. And, and um, kind of the same question that I had asked Rifko, is this something that was intentional or did it involve through the evolution of Benny as a character? I, um, I think both, you know, um, as I've often, you know, sort of said, books come to me as voices, right? So I, I usually hear the character's voice um, pretty clearly, especially the character, you know, if the character is a, like a young person, um, the voices come through, you know, I just, it's not like I hear them with my ears, but like I hear them with my mind, right? And the voice is there and there's a certain, with Benny, I, I love that, the manic savant, uh, you, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's got a lot of language. He's got a lot of words. You know, he's he's really insistent. Um, he's got a kind of edge, you know, slightly belligerent edge, but he's also really kind of expansive and, you know, sort of loving as well. Mm -hmm. um, so he was just, you know, he, he was really interesting to write. I, I really enjoyed writing him. And then um, the character of the book was really also interesting to write because that was a that was a voice that um that evolved i think a little bit more um at the beginning you know the book isn't sure of itself yet the book is is hesitant right it doesn't really know i mean it's a new book it doesn't know how to tell the story yet it doesn't quite understand what the story is going to be so you know it it's trying to kind of intuit and hear the story too and and so it kind of makes some you know, there's a little bit of stutter at the beginning, right? Um, mm -hmm. As the book tries to understand, you know, what what is this story that it's trying to tell? Um, and then, of course, as as it goes on, it becomes more confident. It starts to develop kind of an attitude. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's got all sorts of other, you know, kind of permutations. But and and that was that was also just interesting to write because it, you know, it um, very much kind of emerged um, through the writing. That's interesting. Yeah. I like that very much. Okay, well then, you know, let's uh, let's let's get everybody up here and, and do a uh, uh, a question and answer kind of going back and forth thing. Um, and I'm just going to throw something at both of you right up front, um, largely because you just read and thank you for reading from the beginning of your book. It leads to this question nicely. <laughs> um, but we're going to talk uh, first lines and the importance of them to you as a, a writer. Um, and interestingly enough, there's a commonality mm. uh, between both of you in here that I, I personally found amusing. Um, like Ruth, you begin the book of form and emptiness with a book must start somewhere. Yeah. And while Rivka, you you began everyone everyone knows your mother's witch with herein I begin my account. And I love that those those powerful introductions to story just with a very simple statement. And I'm curious if those were the first lines of your first draft or if they were something that you added in later. Um, and we'll go, we'll start with you, Rivka. Yeah, no, I do. I do love first lines. And of course, like as soon as like the light like turns and it's, I'm like my first line, I just, it sort of like freezes, it freezes me up a little bit, which I think sort of relates to the answer, which is that I do have this, um, need to be relaxed in order for like a, a some of the pros to work and because there's something so unrelaxing about trying to think of the opening it's really something that i do come to quite late um i always have an opening that i tell myself don't worry this isn't your opening <laughs> so that's kind of my uh that's kind of the way that i get started is with a with a an opening that i assure myself um I'm allowed to change it at, at any time. I'm kind of curious. You know, I was I was really moved listening to Ruth. There was something that I hadn't even really picked up on when I read it because I, listening to it can be so different. But the way that 
um, Benny is described as sort of his cells were sort of, you know, hesitant to divide and take up space in the world. And the sort of opening of the kind of the letter and the word and the sentence in the paragraph had that same mm -hmm. shape of, 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 of growth and that same sort of hesitant feel. I mean, I don't know if that was, again, like intentional or something like an incidental kind of um, subconscious resonance that, that emerged, but I'm eager to hear what Ruth has to say. Nice, nice. That's one of those moments, Rivka, where, you know, um, I, what I should say is, you know, yes, of course, I planned it that way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I totally didn't plan it that way at all. Um, yeah, the, the first paragraph, um, I don't, you know, it's funny because I really don't remember when I wrote that. Um, it was not the first thing I wrote by any means. It, you know, it was obviously something I wrote later on. Um, the first, uh, you know, very often I will write, or at least I'll start writing chronologically. Um, but in the case of this, uh, this book, um, I wrote a scene, it was a dream scene that happens um, much uh, later on when Benny first starts hearing the voices. And, um, and that was the first scene that I wrote. Um, and I didn't really even know that I was writing a book when I when I wrote that. Um, it was funny because there's a, uh, a writer's room in, uh, in New York called Paragraph. Do you know that, Rivka? It, I know of them. I don't know where it is. Yeah. But yeah. I, yeah. Well, I was I had gone to Paragraph um, because I needed a place to write. And I, so I was, you know, sort of um, looking around the place and um, and they said, well, you know, you should just go sit down and, and do some writing, you know? And so I was kind of test driving paragraph, you know? And, <laughs> um, and I uh, sat down at one of the desks at one of the carols and um, I had my computer of course, and, and I opened it up and I just wrote this, the scene, this dream scene, right? Um, I have no idea where it came from. It just, you know, I, it must've come from the desk. I think it came from the desk at paragraph, you know, and, and somehow seeped up through my computer and, you know, um, because I can't explain it. Otherwise, it just, you know, it, it came from the space. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't argue. I'm not going to argue with the desk. Yeah. <laughs> you know, wherever exactly. it comes from. I could get into yeah. a whole conversation about where you think yeah. stories come from. But Well, I think somebody um, else must have left that scene, you know, or written something like it there, you know. And, you and yeah. So I would absolutely buy that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so Rivka, in every, everyone knows your mother is a witch. We are in the early 17th century on the cusp of the 30 year war. And I'm curious as to what drew you to that period more. Was it the, um, the time and the historical implications or the specific story of Katerina? Yeah, you know, I was working on a totally different novel, which, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I had high hopes that I would finish because I'm definitely one of those people who starts things and doesn't finish them. Um, and then just because, you know, I feel like uh, everyone's life is up and down, but I, I think I, I'm not alone in having found like the past, you know, five years unusually uh, enervating and, and intrusive into like your inner life and all of those things. So for me, like comfort reading <laughs> is reading about uh, sort of the biographies of scientists. I don't know why I find it so comforting, but it, but it is comforting. And I, and, and, and one thing is that often those biographies sort of intersect with politics and power in ways that let you think about current politics and power without sort of like being on a news feed or being on a doom scroll. Um, so like, as an example, like I thought it was really interesting to read. Um, actually, Madison Smart Bell has this amazing biography of Lavoisier during the French Revolution. And, and, it, and he's, you know, he's trying so hard to be a good guy. And when they kind of storm the Bastille, he's like, look, I'm totally for storming the Bastille, but we can take it down in a safe and orderly way. And he kind of comes in after the fact to take it down in a better way. Um, but anyways, of course, he ends with it being beheaded. Um, and, and I, so, but I found that soothing. I find reading this part <laughs> soothing. And, um, and I, you know, I was looking for, I wanted to read more about Kepler. Um, somehow we all know a lot about Galileo. Uh, Kepler is just like the one who I think, you know, you're thinking it's not Galileo, but it's like Galileo. You know, it's just one of those people who, um, there isn't as much in the English language about for whatever reason. So I was reading anything I could find. And um, 
the best book about Kepler I found was not about Kepler, but was um, this fantastic book, which is written by a scholar, but is written in a way that's not totally internal to scholarship about the witch trial uh, of, of Johannes Kepler's mother. And I just, I'd never heard about it. And in fact, it's excised from the sort of seminal 1950 biography, although later like a paragraph is put in in a footnote. And, and I just, I was totally seized by that story. I, I just couldn't, it felt like it condensed everything I was thinking about, but in this other world, which I, I felt like more, more open to, to going into. That's interesting. I'm, I'm curious yeah. too, as I sit here and listen to you talk about falling into research holes, um, that as a journalist, your your sort of your your life is research. You have to have your information, your facts correct. And I'm curious for you is is research that something that leads to curiosity, or is your curiosity something that leads you to research? Yeah, like I think you've already sort of like described the cycle so well because often when you when you when you start researching something, um, you are actually at the point where you don't know that much. So maybe your choice of like what to focus on is not so great, and then you sort of run into these other things while you're researching that um, that turn you in a great way, or that or that reveal to you that that's really where maybe you're curiosity should have been before whatever it is that whole mm -hmm. cycle is so fun in fact I often feel like um I I do I love reading I guess like more than writing and the only way that like writing kind of competes is that sometimes writing feels like reading it just feels like super intense reading so mm -hmm. that's kind of like the way it works for me anyways yeah that makes sense um Ruth uh I promise not to just ask you about voices, but um, <laughs> but I, I really have questions. I have nothing to do with voices, yeah. uh, but um, you know, a vital aspect of writing is understanding and learning the art of dialogue. Mm -hmm. And you take this to an entirely new level, giving inanimate objects personality and voice. And it would it would be very easy to just look around the room and and find items and plug them into your story. Um, but it seems to me that the the items that you chose, the inanimate objects you chose, actually have greater purpose and meaning. And was this a creative decision? And if if not, or if it, even if it was, how did you choose the specific objects you? I mean, I think you know it was it was uh, a decision that um, sort of emerged again through the the writing, um, and I was in exactly the situation that you describe. You know, sitting here, actually, right here. Um, uh, you know, thinking and imagining uh, the house where this boy lives with his mother, um, you know, sort of closing my eyes, looking around, you know, the imagined house um, and, and and also looking around my house and, and looking for objects. And there really weren't that many. Like, I, I mean, they're, you know, what, like a, you know, <laughs> <laughs> a stapler, you know, I mean, uh, I think there probably is a stapler in there. There's a, certainly a pair of scissors, but I got really tired of like the objects in my house um, and they weren't Benny's objects and they weren't Annabelle's objects. So um, I actually, uh, I, I was feeling um, sort of constricted by my own um, powers of imagination and by my own, uh, my own, I mean, it, it was the, it, part of it is the, um, you know, the pandemic and the lockdown, right? I mean, you're mm -hmm. stuck in this house, like I'm stuck here with my objects, right? Um, and I was really feeling kind of frustrated with that. Um, and so I kind of made a rule for myself that um, when an object came into my, um, uh, into my life, uh, for some reason, um, I would put it in the book, Right. And, and just 
see what would happen, right? Um, and the idea was just kind of to introduce a little bit of randomness and serendipity, you know, something that I couldn't control because, mm -hmm. you know, what I could control was was getting kind of um, tiresome to me. So, um, so what I did, I, so I did this, this is, you know, um, I just kind of kept my eyes out for interesting objects. And for example, my uh, friend um, came back from a trip to the Bahamas, actually, this was pre pandemic. And, um, and she brought me this, which is a, um, a snow globe with a little mm -hmm. sea turtle in it, right? And so this was perfect, right? It was it was exactly the kind of thing that Annabelle would collect, right? So I gave it to Annabelle, mm -hmm. and and then that spawned this whole, um, you know, uh, sort of um, vocabulary or or you know, sort of thread of images of you know containment of you know of globes of round things um, of being trapped you know, inside, inside of something. Um, later on, Benny goes, uh, Benny meets this young artist who makes snow globes, right? Um, as a result of this, right? She makes these, um, you know, these disaster snow globes. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then, you know, anyway, just, you know, so this whole kind of metaphor of the snow globe started to kind of proliferate through the book. Um, something else that happened was um, I was, uh, I moved into a different, into a new house and the previous owner um, had left this very weird uh, poster of um, the Apollo 11 astronauts. Um, and, and so it just was like, okay, let's just put the <laughs> Apollo 11 astronauts in the book and see what, see what happens. And, and once again, that just kind of created, you know, this, this, uh, you know, this whole kind of um, sort of theme of, you know, uh, out, you know, of outer space, of space travel, of, you know, moon landings. Um, so that was, you know, which, which actually made a lot of sense because, you know, the book was about uh, a boy who is diagnosed with a mental illness. And so, you know, this idea of lunacy, you know, of, of you know, it, it, it made sense. Um, uh, I went to a, I guess I got takeout and um, got a, uh, ah, a fortune nice. cookie that says the world is a beautiful book. Uh, for those who read it. And so then fortune cookies, you know, fortunes um, became part of the book as well, mm -hmm. right? Little slips of paper with like enigmatic weird things written on them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it was just this, you know, this this idea of trying to introduce um, something into the, you know, into the story that I couldn't control. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just to sort of see where that would take me. Um, yeah. And it kept it really interesting. And, and then there were these weird things that kind of dovetailed, um, you know, in, in strange ways. Oh, one other one. Um, I, was, I was reading this article. Um, and it was an interview um, with David Mitchell. And the interviewer had asked a question, something like, you know, you know, what is something that you would never put into a novel because it's so stupid? And he said, um, kitchen magnets, poetry magnets, you know, with a dead person talking to the living, you know, <laughs> using using poetry. And I read this and I just thought, oh, this is great. I, I yeah. definitely have to <laughs> I love put this in the in the book. And and so I did. Yeah, exactly yeah. the way David Mitchell said not to. Right. Exactly. Um, but he then um, it's funny because he he had completely forgotten about that. Um, and and uh, says that yeah he, he he denies that he said that but I have the article. <laughs> yeah, so we'll we'll so. chalk that up to uh, one part random fun, one part universal law of attraction, <laughs> and uh, and go with that. That's that's great. Um, so I'm curious for both of you, um, what part humor plays in in your writing to you, like. Um, and, and how you feel it should best be used. And I guess, Rivago, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I um, I sometimes like give myself the challenge where I sort of think, can I name anything? Can I name any work of art that I really admire that I wouldn't on some level describe as having a sense of, of humor? Um, and... I, I usually end on on no, like I can't, I can't think of anything, but I then realize like when I talk to other people that my idea of like humor or slyness um, is, is, is maybe so broad that it sort of becomes not very meaningful because I, I almost think of humor as just there being like 
at least two notes in a sentence or a feeling, the sort of the, the main note and the slightly contradictory one. Or at least, so it's either like an ironic gap or sort of mm -hmm. a, a gap between what one wants to say and ends up saying or whatever it is. So all of those things to me feel funny whenever there's any kind of double sense. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think that's how everyone thinks of funny. So, <laughs> um, so, I, so I don't know, but I, I feel like it's a kind of ubiquitous sign of honesty. It's like almost like a little check. Like if it doesn't have a, a tiny bit of that, oh, like now I, I see things a tiny bit differently than, then it doesn't feel, you know, true as we use that phrase in fiction, like, is it true? And, and, and I, I often think of that as a, as a little check that protects me from, you know, grant, little moments of grandstanding or things that just don't really belong in, in, mm -hmm. in, in fiction, but that we all occasionally have like our op-ed voice that like emerges and has like an op-ed or whatever, and op-eds <laughs> are like not funny. Um, so that, that, that's kind of what it, what it is for me. Okay. Yeah. Ruth? Uh, that is so, I, I love that you said that. Um, because that idea of a sentence doing two things at once is something I I think about all the time, and you know the, the I've always thought of it. Um, and and you used you know irony is is exactly that right? It's it's this idea of of speaking out of both sides of your mouth at the same time time right? Um, but it's also um, I, I've also kind of thought of it as a kind of, um, uh, what is it, overtone singing, you know, where there's two resonances at play, um, you know, and and the tension that's generated between, you know, that the, the two voices there um, is something that really interests me. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, humor used you know, in, in that way, uh, it, 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 I, I think irony is exactly the, you know, it's kind of an ironic undertone. Um, and that operates on the sentence level. And then there's a kind of larger humor, um, you know, or a tonal level, um, sentence by sentence. But then there's a kind of larger humor, too, of, you know, uh, you know, humor and action, for example, um, you know, funny things happening, um, which is a completely different kind of humor, but is, but it also relies on um, juxtaposition, I think. And, and um, you know, this, when I was, uh, you know, in college a uh, long, long time ago, um, I was fascinated, you know, and, and reading a lot of Shakespeare and was fascinated by the, you know, by the way that Shakespeare does this, you know, and, and um, uses the clowns, you know, right, always brings in, um, you know, it, it sort of juxtaposes something, uh, you know, a funny interlude, and then, you know, you get hit with the tragedy. And so as a result, the tragedy is more tragic, right? Be, you know, because of the, the the comedy. And so that's just something that, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm attracted to that. And, and um, uh, you know, I think there's so many ways that humor can function, um, but those are certainly two ways that I identify with and I think about in a conscientious way when I'm writing. Excellent. Um, Rivka, moving back to you here, uh, you had mentioned in another interview that you feel like historical fiction is just a different color of science fiction or fantasy, which I found to be just utterly fascinating. And all I can really ask is, what what did you mean by that? Because I... <laughs> No, no, no. I mean that I do. I got, I think part of that was also me working through, um, being being like, no. I think this is like a legitimate way to dream. This is like a legitimate form of of imagining. And I guess that especially like um, like I sort of feel like with science fiction. You know how science fiction readers are famously super like, um, you know either annoying or fantastic about like, well, actually underwater, the bullet will move at this speed or whatever it is. Or like there's that famous um, little um, kind of play note that came with uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey when it came out where where he was like saying, 
you know, I do know that if they don't have the helmet on, their head will explode like very quickly, but it's just like a two and a half second shot. And I, I made that decision for these various reasons or whatever, like mm -hmm. there, they, there are these like points of kind of inarguable reality that you're kind of working with and then you're playing around them. And so I sort of feel like, well, you know, I'm, that's what was actually just so fun about working with a real historical event was sort of like Ruth was talking about randomness. Like with this story, I, I immediately thought, well, if I was writing this purely from the imagination, the whole issue of like, basically, is she going to survive or not survive? And how is that gonna, would be, you know, just this huge artistic decision, but I really loved not being in control of it. And I just, mm -hmm. that was something I had to work with. And at the same time, it wasn't a, a work of historical scholarship. It was something that said, okay, we've got like kind of 12 points on this drawing and I'm gonna respect all of those points. And then in between them, it's a work of the imagination. Like it's really a work of the imagination. So in that way, I really do connect it with them. Um, with, uh, I mean, more with science fiction than with fantasy, but with fantasy in the sense that once again, like something in, you know, the fantasy that I like really love, there's something in it usually psychologically accurate or whatever. So you have that, or, or the, those are the fixed points. And then the imagination builds like this kind of other situation in which uh, we can see these psychologies or emotions or whatever it is that is the kind of fixed bridge uh, between yeah. our world and that world. Yeah, makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. Um, so Ruth, uh, um, I wanna talk about Annabelle. Mm -hmm. um, and she's, she's such a fascinating character. Um, she's a hoarder but you allow the reader to see the value she places in the objects that she keeps. You give adequate reason to this need to collect and possess things. Um, how difficult for you was it to find empathy with her or were you drawing from your, your life or life experiences in some way? Mm, well, I think that all characters on some level, you know, are drawn from, you know, one's life experience because where else would they come from, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, with Annabelle, uh, there was there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of um, you know sort of material in my life to draw on. My my parents were both uh, they weren't hoarders um, at, by any means, um, but they grew up. You know, they were born in 1914. They grew up during the Depression, and they never you know, they didn't throw things out. They did not, you know, they they took their possessions very seriously. Um, and so when I was growing up, you know, um, every like piece of tinfoil had to be washed and, you know, sort of flattened and folded for reuse. Um, same with, you know, plastic wrap. Um, they, they were just very, very careful. Um, and so, but as a result, you know, I mean, they, you know, over the, over the years, things, you know, accumulated. Um, and so cleaning, and, and so when they, when they finally um, died, it was up to me, I'm an only child. And so it was up to me to, you know, to clean out the houses, the house. And um, it was really tough, you know, and it was tough because um, I knew how careful they were with their possessions. And um, and yet I knew that I was going to need to have a dumpster sitting outside and that all of those carefully folded pieces of tinfoil were going, well, I mean, those could be recycled, but there, there were every single check my father ever wrote in his life I had, right? Um, and so, you know, I mean, obviously that could be shredded, but it was still just, you know, I, I, it was hard, you know, it was, it was like, um, you know, seeing, especially things like checks, you know, his handwriting on it, right, became, you know, uh, you know, was, was very sort of, I was very, you know, attached to those, um, but everything had to go. And, and so that was just a very, very, very painful time. Um, and um, the, the other thing too, that was uh, kind of interesting was that my dad was a, um, was a uh, anthropologist and he worked with um, Oneida um, language. And so he was very close to um, several of the Oneida groups and had a lot of things that he had received as presents, as gifts over the years, right? And, and so, you know, I'd come across, you know, in the midst of all of the tinfoil and rubber bands, there'd be suddenly this, you know, this sculpture, right? Um, and, and, you know, sort of, 
you know, how to make sense of it, right? What is it? Where did it come from? Um, is it important? Is it not important? Um, you know, all of that. And I kept thinking, you know, if only, you know, if only this thing could talk, right? If only it could tell me its story, um, you know, I would know what to do with it. And the same thing was true on my mother's side. Um, you know, I had a lot of you know, she had a lot of things that had belonged to her, uh, her Japanese parents, my grandparents. And, um, you know, and, and so once again, these were things that I'd grown up with that were really, you know, sort of precious to me. But, uh, you know, I, I, some of them I just didn't know, you know, I didn't know where they'd come from. I remember in particular, there was this one box of, um, of polished stones, right? And the stones had been, they were, you know, things like agates or, you know, and they had been sliced into, you know, just thin slices and then polished and then mounted to little pieces of cardboard. Mm -hmm. And um, this was something that had belonged to my grandfather. And I used to play with them when I was a child. And I thought they were, you know, I mean, they were very precious to me. Um, and I thought they were worth, you know, a lot of money, right? They were like, very precious things. Um, but then I found out uh, later on, much later on, that these were um, stones that my grandfather had um, had found in the desert in Santa Fe when he was interned in a Justice Department uh, concentration camp there. And, you know, I think they must have had a, you know, uh, they were making these things to sell for souvenirs, you know, for gift shops to sell for souvenirs or something like that. Um, and, and so these were some of the rocks that he had collected and polished during that time, right? And, uh, you know, that story I happened to know and, and you know, I was very grateful for knowing it, but on the other hand, you know, there were um, so many things that I just had, I had no idea, um, you know, what they were or where they'd come from. And so, you know, it was, um, yeah, it, it just made me very, it made it very clear to me that everything has a story, right? Yeah, excellent. I want to talk a little bit about influences. Um, when I know what personally, Growing up, that um, the Charlotte's Web and Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing were two books that inspired my desire to read more, and also for my love of storytelling. And I'm I'm curious um, if we go into the way back machine here, what books contributed to your to to your life as a writer, to you know things that influenced you early on. Um, and, and Ruth, we'll start with you on this one. Sure. Well, you mentioned Charlotte's Web. I mean, that is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that's kind of like the perfect novel. I mm -hmm. was talking with Karen Joy Fowler about this, and she she and I both agreed that this was the perfect novel. Um, and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so that makes it true. Um, but, you know, it, so, it, it's so, I read, I reread it recently, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, of course, we think it's a novel about a pig you know, and a spider and a little girl named Fern, but, um, but it's not, it's about, uh, it's about a writer, you know, and mm -hmm. it's about the power of words to save lives. Right. And mm -hmm. um, I read it and just started sobbing at the end of it <laughs> <laughs> when I realized, I guess it was a sudden realization of how important that book had been to me, you know, mm -hmm. um, so that um, Wrinkle in Time, uh, of mm -hmm. course, Harriet the Spy. I mean, you know, all these books about, you know, little girls who like to write things and, mm -hmm. you know, get in trouble. Um, and, but then there was another one that, um, that I thought about. Oh, right. Harold and the Purple Crayon. Mm -hmm. Remember that book? Mm -hmm. It was such a lovely book. And, and that's kind of what I felt like when I was writing the Book of Form and Emptiness. It was like Harold, you know, kind of drawing his house and then, you know, open drawing a door and then opening mm -hmm. it and moving into it, right? And that's what we do as writers, right? We, we draw these worlds and then we enter them. And I think that was, uh, you know, probably the first introduction I ever had to, you know, to metafiction, you know, to, um, to, that, <laughs> yeah. to that kind of thinking, right? That mm -hmm. kind of layered thinking. What about you, Rivka? Yeah, that is such a kind of beautiful book about form, actually. Um, mm -hmm. sorry, it is, but, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I'm just actually like still like sort of seven minutes ago when Ruth was telling this like incredible stories about basically being in almost like a haunted house in the house of her parents and each object, some objects were sort of like mute, some were able to speak. They have a lot to say, like they're woven through time. It's just so, um, it's just so moving. And um, it's like an interesting connection to your book. 
Um, but I, I actually think that like in a funny way, um, I would cite that almost as like the kind of influences I have because I do, there's something about childhood, like whatever your childhood is, it's so loud, it's so formative, it's so, it's, I don't know, I actually remember as a child, my dad saying, you know, the years before 18 were, were like a forever and every nothing since then has, you know, nothing since then, you know, of course, well, I was like, what about me or whatever, but like, <laughs> he, 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 didn't quite, he didn't say it in the best way to say to your child, but it was so sincere, like that uh, nothing since then had the same, you know, intensity of experience. So I actually grew up in this household, which in some ways was strange in that I'm both my parents were, um, smart and and kind and generous but there were just like almost no books in the house and i don't know if it's because english was not their first language or they they weren't accustomed to buying books or you know bringing kids to the library that wasn't just like it just wasn't the norm um so i was like very um hungry for language and and, and my dad actually loved the dictionary he loved learning the english language which he was fluent in but like he just he'd say like cheesy like what does that mean what does cheesy mean and they're like I couldn't define it very well um so he loved the dictionary um and also but it because there were almost no books the one book I had which was super meaningful to me was the phantom toll booth which I think is meaningful to a lot of people um but things like the celestial seasonings tea bags, the way they put like a little piece of poetry on the bottom yeah. and on the inside flap. And like, you know, it's sort of like the fortune cookies. It feels like all the more meaningful because it's like <laughs> tiny and hidden. So I, I took those things really seriously. And also like, just like technical languages was like the, the nutrition on the side of the cereal box. Like those words were like exciting to me, you know? So in a funny way, I feel like I had the hunger and then I had like a kind of weird nourishment but it almost didn't matter it was it was it all works you know yeah. and it was when i was older that uh <clears throat> that I, I developed a more mature and interesting <laughs> relationship to story and 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 language it, it's interesting it's such an interesting question and you learn so much about people as readers and writers when when you find out what the early influences were like yeah. i can i can very easily see how you know, being being compelled to read nutritional facts as a child kind of just feeds into that hunger for knowledge and desire to to know the information, yeah. and then at some point in time, then to disseminate it to others. You know, so um, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, Ruth, you had mentioned um, Karen Joy Fowler, and I had found a, a, a piece of advice that she had given you that meant something to you that was, I think. I think all writers should have an invisible spot wherever they're writing at. And it is, you can only be the writer that you are. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I'm curious, what kind of impact did that have on you and your writing? And then I'm gonna follow up with you, Rivka, as, yeah. uh, with any advice that maybe you were given that you might want to share. Well, you know, I'm trying to remember now the context uh, for that. Um, it was probably when I was bemoaning the fact that you know, I wasn't somebody else, right? I mean, I wasn't some other writer. <laughs> and just fill in the blank, you know, just fill in the mm -hmm. blank there. It doesn't, you know, I, I don't even know. And Karen, um, you know, Karen is, uh, uh, not many people know this about her, but, you know, she's kind of a Zen master, you know? And, and that is like such a Zen thing to say. Um, and I can just hear her say, you know, you can only be the writer that you are. And, um, and it was very reassuring to me. You know, it was just like, oh, you know, obviously, like, yeah. yes, that that's it. You only have what you have. And um, and so you don't have to worry about it. You know, you just have to do what you do as, you know, as wholeheartedly as you can. Um, and if you do that, then, you know, that that's enough. Other people will help you. And, you know, maybe if, if you're um, if you're lucky and you ask for help. But um you know, and, and so it was very, it was a very, uh, it was kind of liberating. And, um, you know, I just sort of found myself relaxing. Um, and I do tell myself that, you know, whenever I'm, uh, yeah, whenever I, I and, and this happens frequently when I'm, you know, sort of overwhelmed by doubt, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it's just like, oh, right, I just have to do what I do. And, and that's enough. Okay. What about you, Rivka? 
Yeah, um, it's also a, a very important Karen writer in my life, <laughs> which is uh, Karen <laughs> Russell. And um, I, I can think of lots of um, things she said that have been influential to me, but, but for some reason, the thing that really comes to mind is I remember um, for a little while I had an office next to her, um, which was like a magic time. Um, and whenever I wasn't, I, I still feel this way, but less, but whenever I wasn't productive, whatever that means, I just felt like a, horrible. Like it was sort of like mm -hmm. there was like, there was being productive and there was just like wanting nothing from the world. Like it just, I, I, I didn't have like anything in between. And I remember mm -hmm. sort of going over and saying to her, like, I just, you know, whatever, the thing you say to friends that you're sort of embarrassed to share to other pe with other people. And I, I can't concentrate, I can't do anything, everything's garbage, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, and uh, I remember as like a sort of way to make me feel better, she just like rotated the screen on her, com on her computer. And there was like a picture of like a squirrel, like in a weird beret with like a funny caption under it. And she was like, it's okay. It's like, all. I mean, she didn't say like, but I felt like what she was saying was like, it's, it's all part of the process. Like that, you know, it, you know, wait, quote unquote, wasting, a, you know, a couple of hours on like squirrel memes. It's just all gonna, it, that's, that's the writer you are. That's like, mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's where everything comes from. Um, and I also think of it as kind of like, um, to bring it back to the kind of in that, that randomness idea that Ruth was talking about earlier, which is that, you know, this object like shows up in her life, like the Apollo 11 poster or whatever. <laughs> and that's actually, I mean, that's like an interesting material to work with because she didn't choose it and, and she has to, you know, there's a kind of interesting dynamic there. And then it ends up like revealing it's like mm -hmm. um, synergy. Right? And, uh, I, you know, I, I thought that was a great piece of advice, even though it wasn't really framed as advice, but as just like, you know, yeah. a distraction. Yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah, that kind of parallels what I've heard a lot, which is, you know, just advice to writers in general is just go easy on yourself, yeah. you know accept who you are and 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 go with that and and don't put too much pressure on yourself but um so Rivka I want to move back to um this early 17th century and um <laughs> why not you know I watched Sherman and Mr. Peabody I can do that yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so when writing from a perspective of history uh, parallels to other periods or even to current events um, can become apparent. And I'm curious, during during the writing process of this novel, did you consciously choose to weave any parallels into the story or do they just materialize organically? Yeah, I mean, I really think sort of on the conscious level, I was trying to... Um, not not be in the present moment that was somehow really like important to me personally not like that that was like an important message in the book it was just important to me personally so consciously but unconsciously and and i wasn't like a total uninsightful fool i like knew <laughs> that there was like a reason maybe why i was like overwhelmed with interest in this period um but i also knew that you know part of part of what i found like appealing was thinking of it as like something that that happened and then other things happened. You know, what? it, it, it always feels like end times, it felt like end times then, mm -hmm. you know, and so mm -hmm. that emotion was important to me. Um, but I did have like one present tense joke that I like let slip into the book that I knew I was letting slip into the book and I'm still like ambivalent about it, but I just have like a little line about, um, and uh, you know, I just have like a small Elizabeth Warren, she, you know, persistent joke that was like my one joke i was like okay one like one 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 contemporary joke yeah, yeah. i like that it's great um so ruth um the you had mentioned benny and mental illness yeah. um and um, uh, you know the the concept of hearing voices is obviously often tied to mental health concerns i noticed in your acknowledgments that you noted the international hearing voices network yeah. um what what about this organization aided in the telling of benny's story well um i have 
<clears throat> I have friends who, you know, have been involved um, with the Hearing Voices Network, um, both as voice hearers as well as um, people who uh, help facilitate, um, you know, uh, group support. And um, and so this is something that I've been aware of. You know, I've been aware of this for a long time. Um, I have, you know, I have friends who are voice hearers, and um, and two, it, it's an experience that you know, that I had, have had myself, um, you know, when, um, after my dad died, um, I, uh, for about a year afterwards, um, I would hear him, uh, and it was always, you know, he would be standing behind me, um, slightly to the right-hand side, and I'd be doing something like washing the dishes, you know, um, and folding the laundry or something, and, and I would hear him clear his throat and then say my name, you know, it was very clear, I heard it with my ear, he was right there. And then I would turn and of course he wasn't right there. And so again, it was this kind of, you know, it, it's so, um, it's so immediate and so visceral to hear your father, you know, right behind you saying your name. Right. And, and so to not see him there was, was always, uh, really, um, shocking and, and really sad, you know? Um, and so every time this happened, I just felt really sad. And, um, and that stopped after about a year, right? Um, but it was something that I, you know, I mean, I, I really like understand that experience of hearing something and and turning around and it not being, you know, not being what you thought it was, you know, what you thought it was. Um, and then too, you know, of course, as a, you know, as a novel writer, um, you know, I, we hear voices all the time, right? We, we hear them and we write them down, but it's a kind of more internal hearing, you know, it's, it's hearing with the mind rather than hearing with the ear. Um, and so I was thinking about this and I remember I was giving a talk at some, at a library somewhere and um, one of the audience members, a um, middle-aged man uh, asked me, about the difference here, you know, he said, you know, you, you're talking about, you know, hearing your characters' voices, hearing, you know, novels coming to you as voices. Um, he said, "Is this a literal? Ex is this a literal experience? Are you hearing with your ear, or is it more internal?" And so I sort of was talking about the difference. It, it turns out that his son was a voice hearer, and um, and you know, was very um, disturbed by the voices that he heard. Um, and found, yeah, found the the um, experience, you know, really upsetting. Um, and so then I started to think about how, you know, the the relationship between these um, these experiences. How, um, you know, on on one hand, um, you know, we as as novelists are in this like really privileged position, you know, where um, you know we have this experience of um, hearing voices. Um, it's an, un, you know, a novel is an unshared experience, right? It it's, exists entirely within within us until we choose to share it, right? Um, and so we're having these unshared experiences, we're hearing these voices, and we are um, rewarded for that, right? We live in a culture where that's okay, right? Not only is it okay, but it's kind of celebrated, right? So aren't we lucky that this happens, right? Because mm -hmm. I can really imagine living in a culture where you would be punished for exactly what it is that we do, making things up out of thin air, you know, um, and then telling them to other people. So um, so that was kind of interesting. And then, you know, um, of course, too, you know, as, as writers, we all have these interior, you know, these inner voices that are always telling us that, you know, that we suck, right? That that whatever it is that we're writing is terrible and, mm -hmm. you know, go out, get a real job, you know, what are you thinking? Um, and so I'm, <laughs> so I'm really familiar with those neurotic voices as well. You know, I've got lots of them um, and, and most writers I know have at least a few. Um, and so those are the kind of, you know, another type of voice that we hear. And then there are the voices that Benny hears, you know, um, which are, uh, you know, again, they're, they're like my dad's voice, very much outside his head, right? And he's hearing it as if with his ears, right? And it's another unshared experience. And those are the kinds of voices that if you, you know, if you tell a psychiatrist that you're hearing voices like that, um, chances are you'll end up with a diagnosis of, you know, um, some kind of psychosis or, um, you know, schizophrenia or, or something, right? And, and chances are you'll also be treated and medicated for that. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the thing is that um, it, it's, there are a lot of people who hear, who have these, you know, um, 
experiences, right? I mean, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, the fathers of you know modern psychology, um, heard voices, right? Mahatma Gandhi heard voices. Joan of Arc heard voices. You know, there's there's you know a lot of literature about people who hear voices who are not necessarily disturbed by them, um, and certainly in other cultures, you know, um, the the you know there are many cultures who um, you know, look at voice hearing as a kind of, uh, you know, a gift, right? Um, and so I really started to think, sorry, this is a long answer, but I, I really started <laughs> to think about this idea of normal, you know, what is it that we call normal? And, mm -hmm. nor, you know, and, and started to think about the idea that normal is really a, you know, it's a social construct, it's a cultural construct. We made it up, in other words, right? We made up that this is normal. And so mm -hmm. if that's the case, then, you know, can't we, you know, reimagine normal? to be more generous and to be more all inclusive, right? And so these are the kinds of things that I was thinking about. And the Intervoice and the Hearing Voices Network, um, those folks are, are, you know, doing exactly that. They're doing this work, you know, and it's, um, you know, it's a wonderful organization because so much of it is really, um, it's peer to peer, um, you know, in a kind of non-hierarchical, uh, you know, supportive therapeutic environment. Um, mm -hmm. And so they're just, they're fantastic. They're doing wonderful work. Cool. Yeah. Well, we have um, a little less than 10 minutes left, and so we'll, we'll get through a few more questions here. Um, I want to ask uh, one to both of you, first off. Um, as writers, you're required to step outside of yourself um, to create diverse characters with whom your readers can empathize. And I'm curious whether in the, the novels we're discussing or any that you have written previously, were there any point of views that were particularly challenging for you? And um, Rivka, we'll start with you. Yeah, and I'm thinking that through. Um, and in, in a funny way, uh, my first novel uh, had a sort of um, older male narrator. Uh, and I remember being frustrated because I thought, why can't I have this kind of know-it-all voice? That's, I, I really wanted this voice that... Um, Whatever I wanted, this certain kind of voice that was, um, you know, I guess like classically like likably unlikable, uh, unlikably likable, likably unlike, sort of all of those things, and kind of obviously wrong but somehow compelling or convincing. Um, and uh, I remember being frustrated because I thought, well, why can't I make this this kind of voice? Why can't I picture this kind of voice in someone? like my age and my gender. Like, and that was like mm. super um, annoying to me. Um, so in a funny way, I've, I've, I've often felt like it's sort of the voice that is closest to me that is <laughs> kind of hard, you know, because I think when it's, when it's you, first of all, you have lack insight into yourself, maybe in, in really special ways. Um, and then, and then also like, uh, I think, you know, vanity and ego and self-protection like comes into play in a way that like maybe happens less when you get outside. I don't know what it is. I just know that I find that it would be in general harder to do to do that voice. And 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 uh I, I do really love um I do really love really young voices and really old voices. That is something I really love just to read. Right. Yeah. What about you, Ruth? What she said. <laughs> <laughs> Can we quote you on that? Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's the voice that is, you know, whatever voice is closest to me, you know, is the one that I have trouble with. Um, and it's usually a problem of, um, well, it's the voice that, you know, I, I get a, I get a note from the editor. It's like, uh, you know, I'm having trouble with this character. You know, it, it's kind of a likability problem. You know, it's like <laughs> she's not really, I just have, I'm having trouble relating to her. She's, you know, she's kind of, you know, resistant, you know, <laughs> um, you know, she, she, she's resisting intimacy, you know, she's, pushing, you know, pushing the reader away. Well, of course, right? It's the character who in some way is, is close to me, right? So, um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's, very, it, it's very interesting because um, 
I think that's where the, you know, those internal critical voices, you know, that I was talking about before, those, you know, are kind of coming into play. And um, there's a sense of, I, I think what I do is I use, um, I, there's a tone of kind of ironic distance that comes into play when I'm writing a character who is in some way, and it could be not perceptible to a reader, to, but I feel is in some way autobiographical, right? There's something that is strong, there's a strong connection. So in this case, you know, it was with Annabelle, right? Um, that, that, you know, the book took on a kind of tone of, I, I called it fond contempt, right? <laughs> <laughs> where the book, you know, was like, you know, mm, Annabelle, you know, and I had, to, it was really hard because, you know, of course that was me, right? <laughs> I'm blaming the book, but it was me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I had to go through and really work that, you know, and, and try to find all of those instances where that little tone of irony, that tone of fond contempt kind of crept in and I had, to, you know, to go through and really, you know, pull those out. And somewhere along the line, I realized, I recognize that. I recognize that voice. It's the same voice that I use to myself when I've done something stupid, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is so embarrassing to admit, but it's true. Um, you know, like, oh, good, Ruth, you know, that kind of, you know, voice. And um, so I kind of had to go through and, and soften that. And, you know, I, I'm hoping it would be lovely to say, you know, and as a result of this, I'm a lot kinder to myself these days. But I think that's, not, that's not true at all. No, it fe feeds into the the idea that we are our own worst critics, exactly. and also and also to imposter syndrome, which you yeah. had mentioned before. Just this feeling that, like I, I don't know, just way too hard on yourself. I like yeah. that. Um, not that you're way too hard on yourself, but that would believe um, me, I am. <laughs> well, I think we have time for one more, so I'm going to give you both the same question. Um, you know, getting published is a very difficult path. Um, obviously, the difficult path doesn't stop at getting published. There's a lot more to do there to sell work and to make readers aware of your work. Um, I'm kind of curious: um, who are the writers that you embrace that you wish more people knew about? And we will start with Ruth. Okay, so um, you you warned us that this question was going to come, and <laughs> I decided that I was going to reframe it. Okay, right. <clears throat> so I'm gonna I'm gonna reframe that question, and I am going to say I'm gonna talk about two writers just very briefly, um, who are publishing their first novels, their debut novels, and um, and they've worked really hard, you know, and you know, struggle to get this far. And so um, they deserve a shout out. One of them is a young uh, British writer named Claire Coda, and her, la her uh, last name is K-O-H-D-A. Um, and her book is, her novel is called Women, Woman Eating, Woman Eating. And it's a wonderful book about a mixed race vampire with an eating disorder. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> she's, she's she's always hungry Lydia her name is Lyd is always hungry and she's trying to find something to eat that won't hurt anybody right at the same time she's taking care of her mother her vampire mother who has dementia okay and it is just a wonderful wonderful book I mean it is it's it's you know funny and compassionate and sad and complex because she's really dealing with a lot of identity issues in such an interesting and weird way. So I love this book. Um, and then the other one, and that's coming out in April. And then the second one is um, a former student of mine. Her name is Layla Motley. And her book is called Night Crawling. And that's coming out in June, early June. And it's a story about a young black woman who ends up, um, you know, walking the streets of Oakland um, and just gets involved with, you know, a group of very, very corrupt police officers. It's based on a true story. Um, and Layla is uh, one of the most talented young writers I have ever had the privilege of working with, and I can't take credit for any of it because she came that way. And um, but she is really, really brilliant. And this is just the beginning for both of these writers. They're they're Excellent. amazing. So Excellent. Nice shout out, Rivka. What about you? Yeah, um, those both sound like really, really exciting books. Yeah, they are. Um, and uh, I guess I guess there's like so many different uh, ways to think about the question and people whose work 
I would love to celebrate. For me, um, uh, neither of these writers are in any way sort of minor or overlooked, but they're in translation. So maybe they're sort of minor or overlooked in, in the US. Um, and so two writers that um, have been really meaningful to me for, for quite a while are, are Cesar Ira, who's an Argentine mm -hmm. writer, um, and uh, Yoko Tawada, who uh, writes sometimes in German and sometimes in Japanese and, and lives in Germany. But anyways, it's just like, yeah. um, even just thinking about translating her is sort of super exciting. Not that I, I could translate her. I just mean the whole, the whole, the whole process. So those are two writers who, who I, I love. And then um, a young writer who sort of has one novel out and has another novel coming out soon, who I find really exciting is uh, Johannes Lichtman. And his first novel was called uh, Such Good Work. Uh, and the narrator is dealing with um, different sort of drug issues and other problems and ends up, but is always trying to do good anyways, ends up sort of trying to work with Syrian refugees in Sweden. Anyways, it, it's, it, it's funny and it's very in touch with the present moment in a way I find very courageous and kind of amazing and I'm very honest. And, um, uh, anyways, and he has another, uh, novel coming out in that 2023, which I'm really excited about. Excellent. Uh, those are books that we'll have to look up. Thank you very much for those. Um, and thank you both. Uh, much though I would love to continue doing this, we have reached the end of our time. So um, thank you to the Authors Guild for sponsoring this conversation. Thank you to AWP. And most importantly, thank you, Ruth and Rivka. This has been a, a wonderful talk and I'm honored to have been here. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Thanks, Zach, for yeah. your questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.